Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let, me, let me thank the Conservative Institute uh, here and the Planck uh, Institute in Vienna and uh, their partners uh, for, for the invitation to, uh, to, uh, to speak here. Um, I'm supposed to, uh, to, to speak a little bit about how not to waste a good crisis. Uh, well, that quote, how not to waste a good crisis, comes from the former Chief of Staff to President Obama, uh, Ram Emanuel, who is now, I believe, the mayor of uh, Chicago. We're about to become the mayor of Chicago. Uh, so let's start there. Uh, President Obama did not waste his crisis. Uh, he introduced arguably the biggest uh, wave of uh, intrusive and illiberal legislation the United States has seen since the 1960s and perhaps the 1970s. Uh, now that, that's a lesson to us that crises don't always lead to more liberal outcomes in the economic sense. Crises can cut both ways. But what crises do, whether they lead to more interventionist or less interventionist outcomes, is to concentrate the mind. Uh, there's a quote from Dr. Johnson, Samuel Johnson, uh, who uh, compiled uh, the first comprehensive English dictionary. Uh, and Dr. Johnson said, when a man knows he's going to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates the mind wonderfully. That's what the crisis is supposed to do. Uh, Leszek Bacharowicz, based on his experience as finance minister of Poland first time around in the early 1990s, said that uh, he had a window of opportunity of about six months during an extreme crisis uh, to ram through critical market reforms. He wouldn't have been able to do that before because there would have been just too much opposition from various interest groups. And he wouldn't have been able to do that after when politics returned to normal, as it were. He had to take advantage of that window of opportunity to ram through reforms and establish a bridgehead to reforms further down the line. Uh, so that's what the crisis is supposed to do. Uh, let me just give you some examples of what's happened during previous crises uh, and what happened with the global economy in uh, the most recent crisis, and then see if that sheds any light on what advantage market liberals can take of uh, perhaps some crises to come, uh, to move economic policy in, in the right, uh, right direction. First example I have in mind is the Great Depression of the 1930s. So we had a severe shock to the global economy, which started with the Wall Street crash, and then several other financial crashes in Europe, leading to a severe contraction uh, in national economies and the global economy. Governments responded to that by putting up the fortresses. They intervened with more interventions at home. So among other things, welfare states were gradually built up. Even worse, Governments intervened in rampant protectionism. There was the smooth hawley tariff in the United States, retaliatory tariffs elsewhere, draconian foreign exchange controls, which actually did more damage than the smooth hawley tariff. Uh, we had global finance fragmenting international enclaves in the 1930s. And then we had John Maynard Keynes coming along with a new theory of macroeconomic policy saying that governments should, in times of crisis, have loose fiscal and monetary policy, cheap money and deficit financing, in order to get through a crisis. That, of course, revolutionized the discipline of macroeconomics. So we had a whole raft of interventions, backed up by theories and ideas, in the wake of that crisis, with long-lasting consequences. So yes, the world economy was restored to some kind of liberality and openness after 1945. And that worked its magic as it were. Uh, we had a re-globalization of the world economy. 
But this combination of Keynesian macroeconomics and interventionist microeconomic policy survived through the 1950s and 1960s into the 1970s. Developing countries, many of them just after independence, newly decolonized through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, went down an extremely mercantilist path, much more so than the developed countries. And these were all consequences of the interventions that came about in response to the Great Depression of the 1930s. If we come forward to the, the 80s and the 90s, we see crises used to push through not interventionist or mercantilist, but liberal reforms. So by the 1970s, in the West, in Western Europe and the United States, the consequences of Keynesian macroeconomics and interventionist microeconomics led to the phenomenon of stagflation, a combination of inflation and stagnant growth and high rates of unemployment. Uh, the old model was seen not to work. There was above all a crisis in public finances, a fiscal crisis of the state. And that allowed certain individuals to take advantage of these windows of opportunity to push through some pretty serious market reforms, starting with the Thatcher Revolution in the United Kingdom, the Reagan Revolution in the United States in the 1980s, and then if you like the single market revolution of the European <coughs> Union from the late 1980s. And the combination of these revolutions was very much about restoring prudence and stability to the macroeconomy through more conservative fiscal policy, in other words, away from deficit financing, and much tighter monetary policy, away from cheap money, combined with a lot of liberalization of product markets, of markets for finance and labor and land as well, as well as a lot of trade liberalization around the world. We saw even more dramatic transformations outside the West. Uh, so big crises in the ex-Soviet Union, in Eastern Europe, in Latin America, in Africa, across Asia, that led to these countries coming into and integrating with the world economy for the first time in a long time. The combination of all that, of all this liberalization in the West and outside the West, led to the biggest globalization and growth and prosperity the world has ever seen in the 25 years up to the last economic crisis in 2008. And this was very much a result of market liberal reforms in the West and outside the West. That brings me to the most recent global economic crisis of 2008 and 2009. These were the years when it was particularly severe. It was a financial crisis. We had a sharp contraction in growth. We had big questions about global integration, threats of protectionism, and so on around the world. The responses to this crisis have been largely illiberal, not liberal. Um, and that clearly brought to an end that chapter of market liberal reforms that lasted about 30 years. And the climate of ideas has changed as well. Economic liberals find it well, more difficult these days to defend and advance their positions than they did before because there has been a revival of Keynesianism in macroeconomic policy. In other words, back to this uh, penchant for looser fiscal and looser monetary policy. And then a lot of people argue for all sorts of interventions in the economy on social and other grounds. And that characterizes many of the interventions we've seen. So what have we seen? Well, we've seen a lot of interventions, but the ones I would pick out and highlight are huge bailouts to the financial sector in the West, much looser fiscal policy through fiscal stimulus packages, and a lot of cheap money. In other words, central banks flooding money into the economies of Europe and the United States. Now, the consequences of all that, I think, are extremely worrying 
for the West. Uh, yes, there is some differentiation here and there, but by and large, the West has had a slow, anemic recovery from this crisis. And that's going to be with us for some time, with uh, anemic job generation and anemic growth. Yes, there are exceptions. Germany is one. Uh, some exceptions, including yours in Eastern Europe. Uh, Canada, Australia are doing well. But much of the rest of the West isn't. And one reason why it isn't and not going to perform well for some time to come is because of this huge accumulation of public debt. Public finances have been shattered in the West. The accumulation of the bailouts and the fiscal stimulus packages amount to about 30% of GDP in the West in 2008. That's the kind of money you need to finance a world war. And because of this debt overhang, there is the threat of taxes going up, of interest rates going up, and also of potential inflation. But those are some of the macroeconomic consequences of this response to the crisis. In addition to that, the United States governments and governments in, in Europe have intervened more in all sorts of microeconomic issues. And what that does in the end is restrict competition. And that, of course, puts more constraints on growth. So if you take the, these consequences, I think there are indeed a lot of worrying consequences for the West into the medium term, not just in the next, in the next few years. The situation is bad in the United States. In some ways, it's worse. Uh, in some ways, not so bad in Europe. But overall, let me point out, or try to point out what I think are the most worrying symptoms of the present crisis in, in Europe. First, we have a range of currency crises and sovereign debt crises in the so-called European periphery. Greece, Portugal, Spain, and Ireland perhaps spreading to Italy in due course, we'll see. Now, the market response to uh, these crises should be to recognize the problem, to restructure all these debts, and that means defaulting on these debts, and push through pretty radical market reforms that these countries have hitherto avoided. But this is not what is being done at the moment. First. There is a denial that there is a problem here of solvency, that these debts have to be restructured. And what you have now is a drip feed of funding from richer European governments, as well as a centralization of policy and of bureaucratic and political disc discretion uh, at the European level to deal with problems in Greece and Spain and Portugal and Ireland. Uh, this is, if you like, like putting sticking plaster on the problem. It's not about real solutions. It's about administrative solutions, often by dictat, more than market-led solutions. And unfortunately, this focus on dealing with the European periphery has distracted Europe's attention from what should be its real business, which is the further liberalization of the single market. We had a big wave of single market reforms now going back almost 20 years. But the single market remains incomplete. We do not yet have a single market for services. Services remain highly fragmented with a lot of internal European protectionism. We do not have a single market for energy, which is one reason why we rely so much on rather undependable Russian gas supplies in particular. What we need to do is to have a whole range of national as well as pan-European reforms to further liberalize and complete the single market. But we are not doing that. Rather, Europe has been quite defensive of these reforms. It has something called the Europe 2020 strategy, which is a damp squib, and is really an excuse for avoiding rather than tackling these, these problems. So, I presented to you my perhaps rather pessimistic take of uh, present problems in Europe and in the wider global economy. 
Let me make some concluding comments about uh, the challenges ahead. Well, from a market liberal perspective, the short-term challenge is to prevent making the same mistakes and making more mistakes along the lines that have been made with the response to the crisis and, and beyond. Uh, so we need to contain a lot of these illiberal interventions. We need to restore sanity to public finances. Uh, we need arguably more expensive as opposed to cheaper money. That's monetary policy. And we need to prevent further interventions in the marketplace that restrict competition. Beyond that, there is an agenda of unfinished business. And that unfinished business is as far as Europe is concerned, moving ahead with single market reforms, the ones I mentioned, and at the global stage, with further trade and investment liberalization, for there is a lot that remains, remains to be done. These challenges are going to be politically more difficult than previous reforms because they do meet they do encounter entrenched interest groups, which are very powerful. Many of them lie within the state or in the public sector. Um, and they are going to be difficult to, uh, to dislodge. Let me end on a, on a note of ideas here. As I said before, we've seen a sort of revival of Keynesian ideas in macroeconomics as well as more interventionist ideas in microeconomics. What is in common between the Keynesians on the macroeconomic side and those who want more industrial policy or more social interventions is that they all believe in social engineering. They all have a social engineering mentality. They believe, as President Obama does in the White House, as many people I come across in Brussels believe in, and indeed, as is the case in many national capitals, that if you get a group of well-meaning, brainy, highly educated people together, they can collectively and technocratically fix the problems of the marketplace, as if they have superior knowledge and superior competence. That's the kind of knee-jerk reaction and the overall mentality these people have. What they do not have is a faith in individuals in dealing with their own situations and in the decentralized mechanisms of the market. And arguably it is incumbent on uh, market liberals to press the message of an Adam Smith or a David Hume or a Hayek more recently that markets are highly complicated organisms that a collection of superior minds simply do not have the knowledge, they don't have the competence uh, to actually fix these problems all over the world. And that more often than not, it's individuals in their local circumstances who are better equipped to do this. And that finally, the task of government is to be a sort of umpire to provide the overall regulation of the market order. To have, if you like, a level playing field uh, and to be an impartial umpire. The job of government is not to be some kind of interventionist player in the marketplace. And finally, very finally, back to crises. We've just come out of a global economic crisis. And one interesting feature of it, which I haven't mentioned here, is that this is very much a crisis of the West. If you move outside the West, and I spend most of my time in Asia, it looks very different. There, the refrain is, crisis, what crisis? Some parts of Asia and other on the emerging world had a much more minor crisis. Other parts, like India and China, didn't have a crisis at all. And most of the emerging world has sailed through the crisis much better than the West and come out looking much better. So it's altered the dynamics of the world economy as between the West and the rest in terms of both economics and politics. 
And bear in mind, emerging markets didn't have a financial crisis. Their balance sheets look a lot healthier than they do in the West. But on that note of crisis, though we have come out of a global economic crisis, the crisis isn't over. It's still very much with us. And I would bet my bottom euro, and perhaps one or two other currencies, including the renminbi these days, that in the short term, there will be more crises to come. And not just in Spain and Portugal and Italy and Greece and Ireland, uh, but in other parts of Europe as well. Because we have the wreckage of public finances, as well as policies on things like pensions and social safety nets that are simply not sustainable because we cannot afford to borrow in the future as we have done in the past. Uh, so there is a cliff coming ahead which will concentrate the mind. And that presents the ch a challenge as to whether we can take advantage of these crises to come to move economic policy back uh, and indeed forward in a more market liberal direction. Thank you. Thank you.